Way back in Unit 2, I introduced logic in two sort of ways. We talked about syntax and we talked about semantics. And so syntax was about the grammar of our language and the rules, and semantics was about meaning and truth. And what we ended up doing was we actually learned a lot of ways to employ syntax and semantics. And the majority of our course has actually focused on two things. One is this pure syntactic manipulation of grammar and rules. And that syntactic manipulation, I'm talking, of course, about derivations. There, we really just learn how to manipulate symbols, and we end up manipulating those symbols in some way to generate some sort of conclusion. Now, the other thing that we did quite a bit of was we did talk about meaning, but only in one particular context. And that context was actually about how to take English statements and translate them into logic. Now, of course, this is a very valuable skill, one of the most that you'll learn in this course, because then when you go and read philosophical texts or you have arguments with people, you, can, you will find yourself quickly symbolizing statements that they say to realize, oh, actually, they didn't say what they mean, meant to say or something like that. Uh, and that's a very powerful tool. But what we haven't focused on in quite a long time, actually and since Unit 2, is actually the sort of core issue behind semantics, which is truth itself. So if you recall, sentential logic has this feature of truth functional, which means that for any sort of statement that I give you, that statement I can fully analyze the truth of in terms of the each TVA, which is to say the truth value of their atomic parts and you can perfectly figure it out. Now we know that there's an annoying limitation about this, which is that for n atomics, we have two to the n rows, but this is a limitation more so for us doing it mechanically. Logic in the sentential realm is perfectly decidable, which means if I wanna know if a statement is true or false or when a statement is true or false, something like a computer can just crunch it no problem and it will always give me a nice answer. And this is sort of the last time we really did any real sort of semantics in the sense of truth. The problem, though, is that truth in predicate logic is not decidable in the same way. We can't just give statements to a computer and say, oh, figure everything there is to know out. And the question is, why? Well, let's take a look at this very straightforward predicate logic statement. For all f, for all x, fx, arrow, gx. If you're an f, then you're a g. So... The issue here is that when I ask if this is true or false, it actually sort of depends on what f and g are. Unlike p's and q's, which I can essentially just stipulate, say, oh, well, let's just pretend p is q here, q is, and, and q is false here, and so on. I can't really do that here unless I know what f and g mean. So here the statement could mean all frogs are green. Is that true? Well, no. Is it the case that every fox is great? Is that true? Well, maybe. Is every feather gigantic? Probably not. And the thing is, once you sort of realize that this sort of hinges on what F and G are, you can see that this will go on and on forever. So the real problem in predicate logic, in terms of this decidability issue and how we should understand the truth and meaning of these statements, is that the truth fundamentally does depend on the meaning of the predicates and actually more than just the predicates, as we will see, uh, of the statements we're looking at. Okay, so if truth depends on meaning, then we're immediately led to the next question, how many meanings are there? How many different meanings are there of for all x, fx, arrow, gx? And as I'm sure many of you have predicted, the answer here is a lot. In fact, not just a lot, the answer is infinitely many. And because it's infinitely many, that's precisely why we can't actually just generate this really nice, beautiful computer program that can solve all these problems for us. We need to think carefully and critically about it, and there's going to be limitations in this pure semantic truth approach to predicate logic. So we have to understand how it is that we can bestow meaning upon things, because that's actually what we're going to do a lot in this section. We're going to look at certain statements and say, okay, well, I want this to mean this, or I'm going to pretend this means that. So how does one bestow meaning? There's sort of three uh, generally accepted ways to bestow meaning. There are probably more, but we're just going to focus on these three, ostension, intention, and extension. Now, ostension is not something we're going to be doing in this course, but it's worth me sort of presenting it so you have something to contrast it with. So what does the symbols C-A-T mean, also known as the word cat? Well, 
If you were talking to someone who didn't know what that word was, one way that you could bestow meaning on the word, or essentially convey the meaning in this case, I guess, is by ostention. And ostention is when you sort of point at things, and you would say, oh, that's a cat, that's a cat, that's a cat. And typically part of ostention is to say, oh, that's not a cat, that's not a cat, that looks like a cat, but it's not. And so really, ostention is the way that we actually teach children how things uh, how things work and what things actually mean. Now, ostention isn't perfect because it might be unclear what it is that I'm pointing at. So in this case, am I pointing at the three cats? So am I generating cats? Or maybe I'm pointing at fur. And so cat, in this case, you might think, oh, cat is like the fur thing on the outside of animals. So you might point to a dog and say, oh, that dog has a cat. And so th there's always problems with ostention, but fundamentally we do use ostention to generate meaning lots of times, especially when we're young or teaching young people. Now another way to do it is to, is to do the meaning intentionally. So intentionally means that we actually bestow meaning by supplying a definition. And this definition is supposed to like perfectly capture what it is that we're talking about. Now the thing is, this might work in very precise fields like, say, mathematics, uh, where I have to give a very precise definition of a circle, and that's not that difficult to do. A circle is a set of points that are equidistant from a singular point. Okay, but if I'm trying to capture the meaning of something like cat, which isn't this like perfect, beautiful mathematical concept, uh, well, we might have a problem. So here's a, a quick Google search later. A cat is, uh, let's take a look at 1B. Any of a family of carnivorous, usually solitary and nocturnal mammals, such as dot dot dot. And so, okay, that's the definition of a cat. But really, does that capture the full meaning of a cat? Is it going to miss out on certain animals that actually are cats? Or is it going to count certain animals that uh, sort of satisfy the definition but aren't a cat? So defining something intentionally is also sort of philosophically problematic, but we're not really going to worry too, too much about that here. The last way we can define something is extensionally. And an extensional definition is going to seem bizarre to a lot of people, but in fact we do do this in a lot of natural situations. So one way I can tell you what a cat means, and, and the reason why this is going to seem weird is because I chose a weird example, namely cats, is I could actually just say, here, I'll show you what all the cats mean, and put all the cats together, all of them, into this big pile and say, there, that's a cat. That's what cat means. Cat picks out all these things. Now clearly that's very impractical, so I wouldn't actually maybe physically have to put them in a pile. I could list them out. I could uh, sort of get you to imagine them, which is hard if you don't know what a cat is already. Uh, and these are sort of the problems with extensional. So let's look at an example that isn't uh, as sort of bizarre as cat, or maybe isn't as bizarre. Uh, so what does PHL245 student mean? Well, one way is that I could just point at all of you. And if I point to all of you, or at least most of you, then uh, someone would really understand, oh, that's what a PHL 245 student is. But this is a bit tricky. Am I pointing at all the right things? You know, have I, ha have I pointed at things to make it clear what a PHL 245 student isn't? Still, this is actually a reasonable way to do it. I could try to give an intentional definition of a PHL 245 student. I could say uh, a, a PHL 245 student is a student registered at the University of Toronto, who is enrolled in PHL 245, and so on. Um, but I don't know, maybe there are some people who are actually taking this course who aren't registered at U of T. They're just sort of taking it for fun. If so, good for you. Now, another way I could do it is, of course, I could just try and generate the class list. And so if you don't see this, but I do, when I go to Quarkus, I get these sort of like different options, and I can here click here to download the entire course roster, which I have to do when I build things like my gradebook, and that could be the PHL245 student. But that is an extensional collection. That's to bestow meaning extensionally. You would say, what's a PHL245 student? I'd be like, oh, here. And I would just give you this list of everyone who's a PHL245 student. Now, what you can sort of see is that ostension, intention, and extension all bestow meaning on a concept. But it's sort of unclear if the meanings are sort of all the same or what are the relative advantages of one or the other. And uh, there's all sorts of other like hard philosophical questions, like how does one bestow the meaning on something if we 
uh, don't know it already? Does it imply that we have sort of this interconnection to concepts and then we're just trying to express this connection and so on? These are tough questions and philosophically rich questions in the philosophy of language, but we can't really go over them here. Now instead, I'm going to adopt a very simple uh, claim and it is a false simplification. So the false simplification I'm going to adopt for the remainder of the course is that ostension, intention, and extension all pick out the same concept. So if I wanted to explain what cat means, I could do it ostensionally, intentionally, or extensionally, and ultimately we would all know what a cat is, regardless of which way I gave it to you. Now this is a false simplification, and if you're wondering why it's false, well, you need to go take some early analytic philosophy or some philosophy of language, because that's a really interesting question. For the rest of our course, I'm not going to worry about ostension at all. We're going to look at intentional definitions of things and extensional meanings of things, which is where we sort of just collect things together. And that's what's going to help us answer the question, what does this mean? And we're going to use our intentional skills and our extensional skills to list out many meanings for a sentence like for all x, fx, arrow, gx. And once we have those meanings down, then we can start bestowing semantic properties on things like we did in unit two. So the next thing we're going to look at is we're really sort of going to pad out our knowledge of intention and extension, and then we'll be able to jump into semantic properties.